Kathy Ofer. She is from Apex, North Carolina. She's been married to Mark for 49 years. They have three children and seven grandchildren. Kathy and Mark love to entertain and read books out loud to each other. I think that's nice. <laughs> so please give our special guest speaker a rousing hand of applause. I thought we were going to do two stepping today. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> you lost uh, the mic to hold it, or do you want to stand? Okay, well, I'll have to roll it. But I'm going to get it lowered first. Okay. I don't know. We'll see. Okay. Hello, ladies. Hello. Well, I was hungry and I feel fed. <laughs> that was great. Well, I want you to picture Cinderella and her life before the cruel stepmother and evil stepsister. You know, she had a very loving mother and father. She grew up on a magnificent farm. She had a beautiful horse. She had farm animals that she walked with and talked with and she even sang with them, I do believe. Well, I grew up on a magnificent farm. I had a beautiful Arabian stallion that I would ride to the field. I had a farmyard full of about every farm animal you can imagine. I had a beautiful mother, a handsome father. They loved each other and they loved their three daughters. It, you know, it really does, I feel like it, it did seem like a fairy tale childhood, but it was reality, and all that reality took place in Troy, Ohio, on the family farm. And my childhood was quite carefree. Until I was 11 years old, my father and mother called my sisters and me into the family room, and Daddy said, um, I'm very sick. The doctors say, if we believe in God, you should start praying because there's no cure for Lou Gehrig's disease. I have two years to live. He was 38 years old. This, the first time I remember ever having a reason to talk to God and ask him for help. I was 11. We thought we were a Christian family. We lived by Christian values, and um, but our prayer was really not a part of our lives. But soon after the shocking news of Daddy's illness, our extended family began to meet at my grandparents for a Bible study. Now, I don't believe I had ever read a Bible before, but soon my mother and father were talking about God and about Jesus. Daddy started studying the Bible. Daddy said, the Bible is true, the Old and New Testament fit together perfectly, and I believed him, I mean, he was Daddy. Um, and my mother became like a superwoman. She, while caring for Daddy, she wanted to keep our lives as normal as possible. And as Daddy's body began to deteriorate, he was growing in his faith. People, friends would come and visit our home and it wasn't a sad place. It, we, there was hope and peace. But in two years, Daddy did leave for his heavenly home. After Daddy died, I, I would hear my mother crying at night. And one day she gathered my sisters and me together and she said, I was yelling at God and crying and asking him why he had failed me and not healed Daddy. And she said it's plain, she saw very plainly the word, I have not failed you. She wanted my sisters and me to know that we had nothing to fear, that the Bible says that God will be a husband to the widow and a father to the fatherless. So my mother, she continued to be that superwoman, and I had my loving extended family that my grandparents, aunts, uncles, cousins, we all lived like close by. And so life went on. So when I was a junior in high school, we had to write a paper on what we wanted to be when we grew up. 
I wrote that I wanted to be a sports director on an ocean liner or an airline stewardess. So, after graduating from high school, I did go to Eastern Kentucky University where I studied to get a, a degree in secretarial science. My, my mother thought it was very important that I have a degree in case I would ever be a widow. I mean, she was a widow at 40 with three girls. Uh, I did graduate. My most challenging subjects were shorthand and typing. But in January of 1969, I was in Atlanta, Georgia, going through training to become an airline stewardess. My dream was coming true. Now, a major part of training to be an airline stewardess is to know how to evacuate the airplane and keep the passengers <coughs> safe. And quite honestly, I used to have nightmares about evacuating an airplane in the ocean. But that, that never happened. <laughs> Some of the major other part of um, our training dealt with appearance. I mean, we had an appearance check once a month. We had to weigh in every month, which was absolutely brutal. And then we, they checked our fingernails. We had to have our hair out of our faces. Our uniforms had to look fresh, crisp. Um, I was based in Chicago. I lived on Michigan Avenue, the Magnificent Mile. And my life was happier and more exciting than I had ever imagined. I was traveling, staying in nice hotels, meeting interesting people. I was taking my mother on great vacations. And I always was able to schedule my time so I could be home for family events, especially Christmas. Now, when I started flying, it was the era of coffee, tea, or bean. And you remember that book, there was a coffee, tea, or bean. And you know, some women objected to it, but I actually didn't mind. <laughs> I liked walking through the airport with the crew, knowing that people were noticing us. I loved greeting people as they came on the airplane and giving them blankets and pillows and magazines and getting them comfortable. And we would, if we were in the air for more than an hour and a half, we served a meal in first and second class. Now, some of the glamour of that began to go away towards the end of the flight because we had to collect those meals, put them away, be in our, strapped into our seats, and we were literally running. But think about it. I was 20 years old on airplanes filled with businessmen of all ages, and so it wasn't unusual that I could date guys in different cities if I had, you know, layovers in different cities. And I am thankful that I did have a belief that I couldn't hide from God. So that set some boundaries regarding my dating relationships. So I never dated a guy very long because the guys that I was attracted to weren't interested in dating girls like me, which actually didn't bother me. I just move on. I wasn't looking for love. I was having too much fun being single. And I'm afraid that I became rather self-centered and self-righteous. Well, one cold, stormy day in Chicago, I was snowed in and my roommates were snowed out. So I decided to watch my little black and white TV. Well, a man named Billy Graham was on. And I remember having listened to him he looked familiar from when Daddy had been sick. And so I thought I'd see what he had to say. And I must have been rather touched by this, because what he said, because I mailed him $5, got on the mailing list, and I received a notice that it was a Billy Graham crusade coming to Chicago, and they needed volunteers. Now, I've been thinking, I should probably do something like volunteer work on my days off. So I was pretty proud of myself when I walked sacrificial where you walk to that volunteer office and I was looking forward to telling them about my parents faith and how God has worked in their lives and I didn't have much to say about my faith but I had a lot to tell them about mommy and my mother and father so I sat down with this kind man Charlie Riggs he was head of the volunteer training and he started reading through a little booklet called the steps to peace with God well, as he started reading through this booklet, I realized that I did not know why Jesus had died on the cross. 
the booklet had great visual aids, and I brought some, I want to show you what this little booklet has in it. So the first picture shows what the Bible means that it says that we're separated from God. It says that God, man is on one side, God is on the other, and there's a great chasm between us. That chasm is the result of sin. Right, sin is something that I really did not understand. Quite, I was probably the nicest person I knew. So I didn't know about sin or being separated from God. I mean, I probably must have known sin, but I didn't think about sin. And the next picture shows and explains that people have tried to bridge that gap through being good, being religious, giving money, but it says that there's nothing that can bridge that gap between mankind and God. So I began to understand, okay, mankind has a problem, we're separated from God, and there's nothing I can do about it. So the book goes on to say, that's why Jesus left heaven, why God came to earth in the person of Jesus Christ. So I was beginning to figure out why Jesus died on the cross. He died on the cross and rose from the dead so our sins could be forgiven. He paid the penalty for the sin. And the Bible says all have sinned, all come short of the glory of God. And the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ, his son. He made the sacrifice so we can be reconciled to God. But it's not enough, as the book says, it's not enough just to believe in Jesus, but we have to receive him. As many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God. So as Mr. Riggs was talking, reading this booklet, I started talking to God. Now I probably hadn't prayed since I was about 13. And I started talking to God and I said, God, I'm thinking, I didn't know I was separated from God. I didn't know that that was even an option. And I'm saying, God, I don't want to be separated from you, so please forgive my sins, my pride, self-centeredness. Come in and take control of my life. I left that volunteer office a different person. I, it was like, it was, it was thrilling. I, it was like this whole new dimension of life opened up to me, and I wanted to know what God had to say about everything. I actually had a flight that night and I was so excited to, to get to the plane and tell the crew about my new understanding of God. Do you know there was a girl that I was, one of the, the stewardess I was flying with knew exactly what I was talking about. And we started scheduling our flights so we could travel around and follow Billy Graham's crusades around the country. And I was anxious to hear what Billy Graham taught the Bible, started studying the Bible myself, and I know I, it never occurred to me to go to church because I hadn't heard about Jesus in church. So I followed Billy Graham crusades around the country and did then part, part of the volunteering for the Billy Graham cru, uh, crusade was to prepare a short version of how I accepted Christ. And so now my career as an airline stewardess took on a whole new purpose. When passengers asked what I did on my days off, or I would say, I'd tell them about visiting Billy Graham crusades, and I'd tell them about how they could know Jesus. My attitude toward people began to change. I actually found that I kind of cared about them. And then about a month after visiting that office, I learned something that really blew my mind, and that was when I received Christ, that the Holy Spirit came to live within me. Now I had this power to live a victorious life, to do the things God wanted me to do. I understood that that's why Daddy could die a terrible death and have peace and hope. That's why my mother became superwoman, because of the Holy Spirit. It's called being born again. We were, we're spiritually dead, and when we come to know Christ in a personal way, our Spirit comes alive, and I it was I was it was thrilling. 
So not too long after that, I met a lovely couple that lived in Chicago. I lived in the city, they lived in the suburbs, and they invited me to come to their home for a social event that had been planned by the career aid singles in their church. And that's when I was introduced to Mark. Now, he tells people I met him like six times before I remembered his name. <laughs> but after we started dating, we were married in seven months. That was in 1974. Mark and I had some wonderful premarital counseling that helped prepare us to have a marriage that would last. Within about 10 minutes of our private counseling, the pastor said, I sense that we're going to have a conflict here because your temperaments are so different. He didn't have any idea what my temper would be like to live with, and I certainly didn't know what a perfectionist was. But anyway, there's a Bible verse that says, a wise man builds his house upon a rock. Storms will come, but the house on the rock will stand firm. And I assure you that in 49 years, there have been some storms and conflicts that Pastor Massey had warned us about. And Mark and I thank God every day that we build our house on that rock. And the rock is Christ. We've been married for almost 49 years. Mark and I lived in a suburb of Chicago for the first seven years, and I continued to fly until we had our first son, David. Three years later, I did I had a miscarriage with our second child, but two years after that, we had Kate, our daughter. When I was 34 years old, I was diagnosed with severe rheumatoid arthritis. The doctor from the Cleveland Clinic said that I would eventually be in a wheelchair. So Mark, this was IBM, he transferred to Boca Raton, Florida, so that I could be in warm weather. But before we left, three friends that did not know each other talked to me about a doctor in Chicago who treated rheumatoid arthritis as an allergic reaction. So I spent my last week in Chicago at Dr. Randolph's office, went through some testing, made some what we considered rather strange changes in our lifestyle, and I've never been to an arthritis doctor since. We moved, when we moved to Boca, our son David was seven and Kate was four, and we decided to homeschool. Now I have to tell you, I had family and friends who were alarmed. But Kathy, you were an airline steward. How are you gonna teach? I said, well, I know how to read. And I think I can handle second grade material. So that game began my 20 year career as a homeschool mom. And then about three years after we had moved to Boca, we had our second daughter, Susie. Our kids are very spaced. We moved to Apex, North Carolina, 28 years ago. We bought a house on a hill on six acres with a barn, pasture, fencing. And that began our adventure of having horses in our backyard, which sort of reminded me of my magnificent European try, right? <laughs> um, 12 years ago, Susie and I visited my mother. We're making plans to go on this wonderful vacation. It's for Mother's Day. A week later, my older sister called me and told me that the lawnmower had rolled over on mom while she was mowing her hill, and she was dead. She was 89 years young, and it was, well, it was a tragedy. I mean, it was, the next days were like a blur. I, I was so sad. And I wasn't mad at God, but I was sad. I mean, I did not want, I didn't want, I didn't want to be comforted. It was like I was miserable. However, by the day of the funeral, after much weeping and wailing, um, God showed me that mom was just living her life and it was time for her to go to heaven. Dinner was spent on the stove and she left. Now we, we laugh now and say mom couldn't just like go to bed and die in her sleep. She had to die for all the world to see. The, 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 um, the local newspaper said, elderly woman dies mowing her yard. Where was her family? <laughs> <laughs> so even though I had become a child of God, 
So I, have, I mean, I've had a number of challenges in my life. I had a miscarriage, I had arthritis, and in 2008, I almost had a heart attack. I um, ended up going in and uh, had two stents put in my heart. I had my main artery, my heart was 90% blocked. I mean, I was like dead woman walking mm -hmm. and didn't even know it. So I lost my mother on a lawn mowing accident. Mark is a cancer survivor. We've had the heartache of some broken relationships within our family. Most recently, our 19-year-old grandson was diagnosed with type 1 diabetes. That's very alarming, I think you all know about diabetes anyway. But you know, although I had, all through this, these different events, I've experienced a peace that does pass understanding and it's because I know that Jesus lives. I'm a child of God. And it's God who holds our future. As my mother had said, I have nothing to fear. A number of years ago, I met a girl who had moved here from Germany. And we had a few things in common, like horses. But she had no interest in hearing about having a relationship with God. And we were out to lunch one day, and she said, so Kathy, do you believe that if I don't believe what you believe about Jesus, that when I die, I'm going to hell? And I said, yes. And she said, well, that explains why it's so important to you that I become a Christian. There's a Bible verse that says, who, he who has the Son of God has life. He who does not have the Son of God does not have life. So I want each of you today to ask yourself, do you know why Jesus died on the cross? Are you a child of God? Do you know you have eternal life? Not based on what you've done, but because you believe in what Jesus accomplished on the cross when he paid the penalty for our sin and he rose from the dead. And just as I wanted my friend and those passengers on the airplane to know the truth, I want to make sure that each of you knows this truth today and experiences what, what the experience that I had in that volunteer office a long time ago. So I'm going to, going to pray a prayer similar to the one that I had prayed. And if this prayer expresses the desires of your heart, if you you believed in God and Jesus Christ. I mean, I would have said, I love God, and I believe the Bible, because Daddy had said it was true. I didn't read it, but I knew it was true because my Daddy had said so. But if you never made that decision or understood why Jesus died and rose from the dead, that means that you're in that first picture. You're separated from God, not necessarily because you want to be, but maybe because you didn't know how to bridge that gap. <coughs> so I'm going to pray that prayer. And if it, as I said, if it, if it expresses the desire of your heart, pray that with me. Dear Lord, I know I'm a sinner and I ask for your forgiveness. I believe Jesus Christ is your son. I believe that he died on the cross for my sins and that you raised him to life. From this day forward, I want to trust him as my savior and follow him as Lord. Guide my life and help me do your will. I pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. So if you prayed that with me, and I'm talking about the first time, if you've prayed to receive Christ before, you don't have to keep praying a prayer. But if you've prayed to receive Christ for the very first time with me, you have crossed that chasm. You've begun an adventure, the adventure of being a child of God. And I would like you all to get take your comment cards, which are at the table. I'd like to go over these comment cards with you. Y'all have one? <laughs> you have to look at it so you can know what I'm talking about. <laughs> 
course, it would be good if you put your name and phone number on here, maybe, and, and uh, how you even happened to be here today. You came with a friend. But the first box says, I just made the decision today to receive Christ as my Savior. If you pray for the first time today, I, I ask you to check that box, and when you leave, you're going to be giving me this card, because it's important when you make the decision that you tell somebody about it, that you tell people that you have received Christ as your Savior. Then the next box says, I would like to learn more about it, what it means to have a relationship with Christ. So there are women here that are ready to explain, talk to you so that you can understand maybe more clearly what I've been talking about. Perhaps I am a Christian and would like to grow more in my faith, so you'd like someone to contact you. I'm interested in a small group Stone Cross Bible study. I have to say, if you're a Christian and you're not in a Bible study, you're probably starving spiritually. You have to be in God's word for your spiritual food. It's physical food for your physical body, but you're a new person. You have, you've been born again. You have the Holy Spirit. You need to feed your spiritual life. So you, have, you need to be in God's word. And then the last box is I would like to learn more about this group and opportunities to be involved. So then there are comments, which we always love to have comments about how you felt about the luncheon, how you felt about the singer, <laughs> the speaker. <laughs> uh, but any comments that you have that are going through your mind that you'd like to tell somebody, write it down. That will be, that's good for us to hear. And when you leave, I am going to be standing at the door and you can give me your comment cards. And um, it's just been so fun. I was in uh, Bristol, Virginia yesterday and now it's fun. I, it's like funny, I'm in Tennessee, it's been a while. So um, thank you all for, you've been so quiet, thank you for listening. <laughs> and uh, I'll see you when you leave. <laughs>